Okay. Great. So it's our pleasure to introduce uh, the last fourth lecture of Anton's course. And uh, so Anton, please continue your beautiful lecture course. Uh, thanks a lot for the introduction and for nice words. Um, thanks a lot for everybody for being here. I know it's a marathon with several very exciting mini courses. I, I don't count mine among them, but the others are very interesting, I know. So uh, thanks for coming to listen to this last installment of this uh, mini course. And here is, uh, uh, I'm displaying again this page, uh, this uh, the map of the world. Um, so uh, this is the interaction of those uh, different fields. And finally today, we're gonna discuss what those interactions are. Uh, and for today, we're gonna change the strategy up to now. Uh, oh, this was really a relatively detailed description. There was a cheating uh, here and there, but now I think we need to speed up or rather maybe, maybe speed up is not a good word. Uh, we should advance with, uh, with a bigger picture. So um, mostly I'll show you, first I'll show you how this big picture works in more detail. And then uh, I, will, I will tell you a little bit more about definitions. So in the beginning of the definitions perhaps would not be very clear, then we'll uh, go through some of the definitions to understand what we are actually saying. And I will end up with some uh, open problems and conjectures. So um, here um, down the road, um, okay, let's say uh, part four, the big picture. And uh, let me uh, let me start by recalling some stuff that we saw on previous uh, on previous lectures. So we are looking um, at a two-dimensional manifold oriented, usually with boundary. Uh, but now, to simplify our life, we can focus uh, on a pair of pens. So a sphere. Uh, with three holes. Um, so we are talking about the fundamental group and about the first, uh, first homology group, H of sigma. And we are thinking about uh, expansions. So expansions are maps from the group ring of the fundamental group to the Tensei um, algebra of H. In other words, to a linear span uh, of uh, words in letters uh, from H. Um, so um, we assume that uh, this is a group-like expansion, which means that uh, it's a Hopf algebra homomorphism and uh, it's, uh, there is a filtration on k pi the, and the associated graded uh, of theta is actually uh, equal to identity. So this means that associated graded of theta is the identity plus, plus Hopf morphism. And now, now we had a theorem with many parts and many authors, uh, which was saying that the theta is a Goldman expansion. That is, it induces uh, a lehomorphism from the Goldman Lee algebra with the Goldman bracket to this gadget that we constructed last time, uh, the space of cyclic words. So this is cyclic words in H together with the KKS bracket. In fact, if you do completions in the right way, 
this map will be actually an isomorphism, but I'm saying it's a leaf homomorphism because uh, uh, maybe I didn't didn't speak enough about completions. So, but in principle, that it one can uh, one can upgrade it to a Lie uh, isomorphism, and so this statement is isomorphic to this so-called KV1. And KV1 says that theta of uh, gamma one is, is conjugate to exponential of X1, theta of gamma two is conjugate to exponential of X2, and theta of gamma naught equal to gamma one, gamma two, is conjugate to exponential of x1 plus x2, where gamma one and gamma two are generators uh, of pi and xi, sorry. So xi is uh, a homology class of gamma i. So that's, that's, that's what we saw. Right. So now, uh, with the next uh, slide, actually, I decided to prepare one more slide for this mini course. So with the next slide, we'll see many, many more statements like that. But if you just stare for a second again at this statement, uh, right here, it connects two different fields, one can say. So the first statement uh, is a kind of uh, mm, Topology statement, right? It operates uh, with some structures related to the fundamental group. Uh, so there is this uh, Lie bracket defined in terms of uh, intersections of curves. Then uh, it has uh, some kind of canonical associated graded object that graded uh, Lie algebra that we identified this something which derives from the KKS bracket, but in principle, we could have defined it purely topologically, kind of for us, maybe many of us are Poisson geometers or um, I don't know, model space researchers. For us, it's pleasing to do it with, uh, uh, with Poisson geometry, but in principle, you can do all that in topology. And now this KV1, uh, is some pure algebra, or you can say Lie algebra or free algebra. I, I, I don't know. So, so this is this is a problem which is completely algebraic, and we'll see many such things on the next slide. So, and here there is uh, there is an equivalence between solutions of KV one and uh, solutions to this problem of. Uh, uh, of constructing a Lie homomorphism or even after, after completion, Lie isomorphism uh, between the Goldman Lie algebra and its associated rate. Okay, so, uh, well, here comes the next slide. So let's spend some time talking about it. At the moment, many words will not be clear, and then we'll try to clarify at least some of those words. So that's a big list of results. Uh, maybe if we start from the bottom. So at the bottom, I'm saying that uh, there is some gadget which is called Goldman to Rife expansions. And uh, probably that's the only thing which is really well defined for now. And uh, which is not surprising, right? On the previous slide, we were talking about uh, expansions which induce an isomorphism of Lie algebras. But recall that uh, during the first class, we, we saw that there is also a Lie by, uh, a co-bracket, the derived co-bracket uh, on G of sigma, and uh, it equips G of sigma with a Lie by algebra structure, right? So in fact, it's very, very natural to ask, suppose we add that element. Then, of course, after passing to associated graded, there will be a graded version of, the, of that delta. So some kind of companion of the KKS bracket. If uh, we have time in the end, you, you can ask me a question and I'll tell you how this delta graded looks like. It's already right, a little bit surprising. So KKS comes with some kind of companion. We didn't know that from standard Poisson geometry. 
Uh, and, and of course, now you can ask a question. Uh, suppose we have, uh, again, uh, theta and expansion. Suppose it's a Goldman expansion, but what's going to happen to delta? Is it going to be mapped to delta graded or not? So for now, uh, let's say we just define those Goldman drive expansions and uh, we are defining them as expansions which would map the bracket to the bracket and the co-bracket to the co-bracket. It's clearly more restrictive. We don't know yet how much more restrictive, but it sounds interesting. So um, the, same, the same thing happens on the KV side. So uh, we saw this KV1, a set of conditions on the automorphism of a freely algebra. Uh, and uh, it turns out that there is another condition called KV2. Actually, I didn't write it in a good way. So KV2. And uh, this condition, KV2, would be responsible uh, for this uh, core bracket, for this core bracket map. So recall that core brackets, they correspond to self-intersections of curves. So in interesting news in algebra, there will be some kind of stuff which corresponds to, to, to those self-intersections. There will be some equation. So I'll, I think I'll be able to show you that equation. Uh, and uh, here there is really an isomorphism between the algebraic problem. So this uh, KV problem and um, the, uh, the topological problem, these Goldman derived expansions. So that's, uh, that's, that's really an isomorphism. Um, then there are two other things that I would like to bring in. So there are some gadgets from number theory, so-called uh, formal multiple zeta values. We'll, uh, we'll see them a little bit later today. And uh, those formal multiple zeta values, they satisfy all the, uh, let me state it vaguely, all the relations that ordinary multiple zeta values satisfy and that we are aware of. So that's maybe not a, a, a little bit uh, cryptic, but I think it's a more or less correct definition. And then uh, it turns out that here there is an inclusion of sets. So from each uh, set of formal MZVs, you can construct a solution of the KV problem or a golden drive expansion. And finally, uh, there are so-called Drinfeld associators. We already saw on the first, uh, on, on one of those first slides, again, this cryptic notion phi 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 is equal to phi phi, solutions of the Pentagon equation. That equation I will also be able to show you. Uh, just on some next slides. And uh, from there, uh, from an associator, you can construct uh, a formal MZVs. And from associator, you can also construct, construct solutions of KV problem. So that's the hierarchy of problems, which is known for now. Uh, many of those, uh, of those uh, in embeddings or isomorphisms, these are big results or big theories. So the one from associators to formal MZVs is due to Furusho. The one from associators to the uh, KV problem is due to Torosian and myself. From formal MZVs to KV problem is due to Schneps. And the isomorphism between KV and Goldman derived expansions, this is uh, uh, Kawazumi, Kuna, Nef, and myself. Uh, so, um, so as you see, right, we don't hope to explain all that, but at least we want to see some of the definitions, right? Because here, only in the last uh, rectangle or, or well, I don't know, what is this uh, convex body that down there, which uh, surrounds Goldman to arrive. Uh, so only there, we more or less understand all the definitions. Okay, so, uh, so I think we'll spend sometime on giving some of those definitions and towards the end, I'll state um, conjectures and open problems. So um, let's talk about Drinfeld associators. 
And in particular, we start with one of them, the so-called Knižnik Zamolodchikov associator. That's because for that, we already have a lot of formalism. So um, we choose the number of uh, points on a complex plane equal to two. And we have this uh, um, connection, x divided by z. And now, you know, I renamed x1 and x2 to x and y. y over z minus one, so uh, dz, which means that I placed z1 to zero and z2 to one. So that's my mm, complex plane. And here there are those two points, zero and one. And uh, there are several definitions of the Drinflet associator or KZ associator. And uh, let me use the following one. Uh, this is the regularized holonomy which corresponds to this flat connection and to the segment zero one. Of course, uh, strictly speaking, the holonomy there does not make sense because uh, the singularities in the connection are too severe, right? So dz over z integral at zero, it diverges. And similarly, dz over z minus one at one, it diverges. But uh, so there are several ways how you can fix it. And one way, is as follows, you choose two small numbers, epsilon and eta, and here you put, for instance, minus eta to the power y. Here you take whole of epsilon to one minus eta. So this is, this is well-defined and finite, and here you put epsilon to the x. And it turns out that the limit when epsilon and eta go to zero, let's say you assume that epsilon and eta are positive and they go to zero. So the limit is well-defined and you can think of it, I mean, the, as a regularized or a normalized uh, holonomy uh, for, for this pass. So, um, so here those epsilon and one minus eta. <coughs> They are located a little bit inside uh, the interval. Uh, so, Anton, can I ask you questions quickly uh -huh. about that? Um, so uh, I assume that you want to do such a thing also on a Riemann surface later uh, on. Actually, for now, at least not in this mini course. Yeah, OK, but in general, uh, so these procedure that you define depends on the fact that you have a global coordinates. Um, Z, um, which you don't. Sure, uh, I can. Uh, I think what people usually do, they would uh, uh, consider. Okay, I, I don't know, right? I don't. I don't do such things on Riemann surfaces. But in principle, Drin okay. does it a little bit differently. So he introduces some stand standardized solutions near uh, near those single points. Then he continues the solution. One of the solutions along the path. To the place where the other solution is defined, and there the ratio of two solutions is a constant. So I think uh, you would need, if you wanted to do it on a surface, probably you would need to standardize in, in some way, as you say, define uh, some standard solution for that. I, I, I don't quite know. Maybe you do need okay. to choose some local yeah, yeah. coordinate, but I don't plan to do any, any of that. So that's, uh, that's what, all what I need for now. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so um, right. So what do we know, need to know about those Drinfleet associators? First of all, let me cite the theorem of uh, Le and Murakami, uh, which says the following. So in fact, it gives a rather concrete formula for phi. So uh, it's a sum, and here there will be coefficients which are denoted zeta of k1, kd. So that's the sum over d, and then on k1, kd. 
Uh, and here there will be an expression x to the power k1 minus 1, y, x to the power k2 minus 1, y, and then up to kd minus 1, y, plus dots. And I will explain what, what those dots are. So first of all, what are those um, zeta k1, kd? So these are those MZVs. So these are sums in one bigger than n2, bigger than nd, one over n1, k1, nd, kd. And for convergence, you need to assume that uh, k1 is at least two. So, um, so these are kind of uh, uh, multidimensional analogs of integer values of the Riemann zeta function or positive, uh, positive integer values of the uh, Riemann zeta function. So these are very interesting uh, numbers. Uh, but uh, for us, maybe we should first focus on this expression and note that if K1 is uh, uh, greater or equal to two, then these are words which start with X and which end with Y. So then the dots, the claim is that there are unique dots, which are the other words, which either don't start with X or don't end with Y. So all the other words. Such that phi is a group like. So that, that's kind of interesting. You see, uh, formally, for instance, if uh, uh, k1 is equal to 1, then uh, those sums, uh, they are those infinite series, they would diverge. So the corresponding multiple zeta values are not defined. But this procedure kind of defines them. Sometimes it's called the shuffle regularization of multiple zeta values. You add new values, which a priori do not exist, uh, and which would furnish this property of phi. So there will be also terms which do not correspond to any multiple zeta values. Uh, that's because there are some words which end on X if you want it to be group-like. So then you would need to add some words which end on X and they are simply, there is no interpretation in terms of uh, multiple zeta values. Okay. So now we actually know what are multiple zeta values. We don't know yet uh, what are Dreamfield associators. We know one Dreamfield associator, but there uh, on this diagram, there was a whole set of Dreamfield associators, right? So, so now, at least uh, superficially, this is okay. Uh, we know one example of a phi. Uh, and maybe just to tell you, right, since we know one example of a phi, you may wonder, uh, so, so those theorems, right, or those uh, maps. If you have a phi, you have a solution of the KV problem, and then you have uh, a Goldman Turaev expansion, right? Mm -hmm. So you may wonder actually, what is the Goldman Turaev expansion which corresponds to that phi? So I will show you that expansion. In particular, maybe here, uh, I can already make a remark that inside this set, mm -hmm there are those maps psi z. Yeah, remember, we had in the Hitchin theorem, we had those maps psi z. Miraculously, or maybe less miraculously, uh, they, uh, they were furnishing Goldman expansions. It turns out, again, miraculously, or maybe not miraculously, if you, if you have in mind all of the diagram, psi z, they also furnish Goldman to Rife expansions. All right, so now um, a little bit more of associators, just for you to have a slightly, uh, slightly more complete picture. So let me say, uh, Pentagon equation. So for that, uh, let me define the following gadget. Let me call it TN. And this is a freely algebra 
this generates as tij equal to tji and i not equal to j. Uh, you can also introduce uh, generators with the same indices, but maybe we avoid it for now. And uh, the relations are, if you have a quadruple of different indices, the corresponding t's uh, have a vanishing bracket. And then there is this uh, relation, which we actually saw in uh, Nikolai's uh, mini course. So this is, uh, this is the 40 relation. Uh, so those TIJs are chords. And you see, you have two chords bracket with one chord. If we think of a bracket as a commutator, there are in total four terms. So that's how it is a 4T relation. So, right. Okay. Now, um, there is a, a, a good piece of notation here. Uh, so this Tij plus Tik, we also denote, denote Tijk. Now, what about uh, associators? Well, uh, associators for now, they are power series in two non-commutative variables, x and y. So now let me uh, introduce a piece of notation. I will call, for instance, phi one, two, three. This will be phi of t one, two, t two, three, where I am instead of x substituting t one, two, and instead of y, I'm substituting t one, three. And similarly, for instance, phi one, two, three, four, this will be phi, T one, two, three, T three, four. Uh, so the Pentagon equation is the following equation. Well, I hope I don't make a mistake, even though I often do. So there is a phi, 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 but these are not arbitrary phi's, right? These are phi's where you distribute those indices in some way. And this is equal to phi one, two, three, four, phi one, two, three, four. So that's the, uh, that's the Pentagon equation. Arguably one of the most powerful gadgets in this business. Recall that uh, this, uh, so, so maybe I should say that uh, associators, uh, solutions of Pentagon with some minor normalization. So I, I may be not stating very precisely. Of course, if I state it like that, one is also a solution. So you need uh, to fix a little bit that the uh, degree two term is non-vanishing, but otherwise, so these are, these are associators. That's a very, very powerful equation, a very powerful gadget. You know, uh, if we just for a second go back, right? If you have such a phi, you construct many, many things. Those form of MZVs, solution of KV, whatever it is, and uh, the Goldman to Rife expansion. You construct all that from, from a phi if you want, at least according to those results. And maybe, maybe one thing, uh, we know one solution, right? We defined one solution of, uh, of Pentagon. And it would be interesting to know how comes that phi that I defined before solves the Pentagon. That's the classical work uh, of uh, Drinfeld. And it follows from flatness of the KZ connection which is a kind of uh, uh, upgrade of the connection that we were looking at all the time. Now, um, all the points, they can move, or maybe I smaller than J. So all the points can move and the coefficients are those um, TIJs. So this connection turns out to be flat and uh, Pentagon is one of the manifestations of its flatness, probably the most interesting 
manifestation uh, of its flatness. So now um, let me show you uh, two more things. Uh, first of all, right, I promised to tell you uh, how, um, uh, how an associate uh, defines for you a solution of the KV problem, even though we don't know what the KV problem is, but at least the KV one, right? How do you build from an associate a solution of uh, KV one? So that's an interesting um, uh, formula, uh, which was uh, guessed. So I think, of course, Dreamfield knew about it, but Dreamfield knows everything by definition, right? So that's that's not interesting. And then it appeared, I think, in some unpublished draft by one of Dreamfield students, Boyarchenka. And I think it was also found, this formula was also found by Damian Kalak. Uh, and the formula is like this. So to phi, we should associate an automorphism of the freely algebra. And an automorphism of a freely algebra should say what we do with X and Y, the generators. And uh, so X gets conjugated by, uh, phi with uh, some particular choices. So arguments, I, I don't write phi minus one. And here it will be something like this. And maybe I draw, I draw a picture. Uh, so, so you can see all this mm, geometrically. So here, here is our zero. And here is our one. I think uh, what we are doing, uh, we are choosing a base point here infinitesimally close to zero. Uh, this is our gamma one. Um, this is our, uh, this is, um, sorry, in this direction, right? This is our gamma two, I think. So we choose gamma two going around infinity instead of going around one. And here is our um, gamma zero, which goes around one. So of course, zero, one and infinity, they are on the same footing. So we can do it as we want. And that's, that's what gives those funny formulas. Okay, now uh, maybe I go for the last debt before, uh, before talking about um, open problems. Uh, so, um, so there was this mysterious KV2. So what is KV2? So KV2, um, this is a gadget in non-commutative, differential calculus. To be honest, one could have given the whole class about this um, KV2 and how this condition works, but let's keep it, uh, let's keep it brief. So again, let's say we have our freely algebra with two generators and we have an element A. Then uh, of course, freely algebra sits inside the Tensei algebra and tensor algebra consists of words. So these are words in letters X and Y. So every word ends either on X or on Y, right? So that they, these are the only letters in our alphabet. In the freely algebra, there is no constant term. So I can always uniquely write A as AX times X plus AY times Y. Of course, AX and AY are no longer elements of the freely algebra. They are sitting in their free associative algebra. So now suppose I have uh, U, a derivation of L x y such that U of x is x bracket with A and U of y is y bracket with B. 
So then uh, I define something which I call it divergence of U. You will see why I call it the divergence. And by definition, it's the following. It's a cyclic word of the following form, X A X plus Y B Y. You see, it resembles a little bit the classical divergence, right? In a classical divergence, you take a vector field, you're asking what's the component number i of that vector field, and you take a derivative with respect to the coordinate i. So, so dui over dxi, that's the uh, divergence of a commutative, commutative vector field. So divergence of u, sum over i, d u i over d x i. So it's a bit similar here. Of course, this is an analogy. It's not so clear why do we want to take those cyclic words, right? Uh, it turns out that there is a following, well, let's say proposition or theorem. Uh, what is an important property of the divergence in classical calculus? Why we are interested in it? One of the things is the divergence is a Lee one cocycle. So in other words, divergence of a Lee bracket of derivations or of vector fields is the vector field acting on the divergence minus the other or derivation acting on the divergence. So, um, so this is a Lee one cross cycle. I think it should, in principle, ring the bell because remember this derived co bracket was also a Lee one cross cycle with respect to the Goldman bracket. So this is uh, Lee one cross cycle. So then it turns out that you can uh, you can integrate this uh, Lie algebra one cross cycle to group one cross cycle. So let's call it J, and it maps automorphisms of L. Maybe with some special properties, but for now, let's not pay too much attention. It maps it to cyclic words, to linear combinations of cyclic words of X and Y. So now I'm finally able to state the KV2 equation. It says that J of F is equal it's not zero, right? Ideally, I think people would want to have J of F equals zero, but it turns out that it would contradict KV1. So, but you can, you can limit the damage to restricting the right-hand side to expressions like this, where D of X is the sum over K, sum coefficients DK times very simple cyclic words, x to the power k, and this is called the Duflo function. Now, um, perhaps let me also state a theorem. Due to Kashavara and Verne again in 78. So they actually proved the following that um, KV1 plus KV2, they imply the um, Duflo theorem, which states that the center of the enveloping algebra is isomorphic as an algebra to the space of invariant polynomials where G is um, finite dimensional and over a field of um, characteristic zero. So the Duflo theorem was known uh, before, but uh, this kashvara verne approach, that's probably the most conceptually economic approach uh, to prove it for proving it. Um, so one should say that here already there is a little bit of an open problem. Um, so for now, right, uh, 
in order to, to prove this Duflo's theorem, right? For instance, we want to prove it using Kashavara Verum. We need to know that there are common solutions to KV1 and KV2. How do we know that? Well, um, there are several ways, but one way to know that uh, is to uh, look at Dreamfield associators. We know that Dreamfield associators exist because uh, we constructed one of them following Dreamfield using the KZ equation. And then from that, we would produce a solution of, uh, of, the, KV, uh, of the KV problem. In principle, existence of associators considered to be a difficult fact. So we are lucky to have this KZ equation, which furnishes one associator. But um, famously, there is no algebraic proof, direct algebraic proof of existence of solutions of the Pentagon equation. So you, you need to do something like use the KZ. Um, so, um, and one should say that this Duflo function that we saw in the end, right? So this Duflo function D, uh, it collects only a very small portion of information about associator. So the associator has many, many coefficients, right? As we described here. And only very, very specific coefficients of phi, they will go to define some of the, the coefficients of D. So um, uh, one can say, one can ask a question, is there, an elementary proof of the Duflo's theorem, which would not use all this machinery. And as far as I know, this is not known. This is known for quadratic Lie algebras, the Lie algebras which have an invariant scalar product. There, there are many elementary proofs, but in the general case, as far as I know, there are no elementary proofs. Um, right, so uh, let me now um, speak a little bit uh, about open problems and conjectures. Um, so first, for that, let me revisit for a moment this diagram. And um, so in this diagram, you see there is one isomorphism, it's here, but then all the other maps, they are one way. Uh, and conjecturally, Conjecturally, they might, I mean, people think that they're actually all isomorphisms. With reason or with no reason. So, so these are complicated conjectures. One doesn't know how to approach them that much, but maybe now we restate it in a little bit different way. So you see here on the left, it turns out that all those sets, associators, form of MZVs, solutions of the KV problem, and Goldwyn derived expansions, they carry uh, free and transitive group actions. So those groups, they are called the Grotendick Teichmüller group for dream associators, the double shuffle group for form of MZVs, the Kashivara Venn groups for solutions of the KV problem, and Goldwyn derived groups for uh, Goldman derived expansions. In fact, uh, we already know that Kashivar Revering groups and Goldman derived groups, that's the same. So if you want, for now, we, we can stop distinguishing those problems because they are simply, we know that they're equivalent. But um, so there are those maps between groups, GRT maps to double shuffle and to KRV. It is a little bit easier to uh, talk uh, about the corresponding Lie algebra. So those groups, they actually possess uh, graded Lie algebras. And here we have, we get the following. Um, uh, so, some conjectures. Um, so, so those graded Lie algebras, we have, the so-called GRT1, uh, it um, uh, injects into, um, into double shuffle and it injects into uh, the Kashavara Verne Lie algebra. So they are all graded, graded Lie algebras. And on top of it, there is one more 
map, it turns out that there is an injection to GRT from the uh, Freely algebra with uh, Ihara Dreamfield generators. So these are generators in all odd degrees, starting from uh, starting from three. And uh, the embedding in that direction, it's uh, by now already not that recent, but uh, relatively recent important theorem of Francis Brown. Right. Okay. So there is, there is this chain. And again, uh, uh, conjecturally, conjecturally, they are all isomorphic. Right. Uh, um, so this is this is this big set of conjectures, and uh, maybe uh, like in the end we will revisit again the first uh, the first picture of the world. But uh, mm, let me let me just tell the story, uh, the, the, this the kind of amusing story about the development of the subject. So uh, before the this. Um, KV theory uh, was created. At some point, um, one of my uh, PhD students, so she started computing by hand uh, the, uh, uh, the elements of low degree of uh, the commutator of KV with KV. Uh, so Lee, Lee, Lee brackets of elements of KV. And uh, what she obtained, was the following. So these are this is degree, and this is the dimension. So she obtained the following nice result. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Right? Let's go up to twelve. So actually, uh, by hand, it's not so easy to compute. Maybe she she used some relatively primitive computing tools. And she got the following, I think she got till degree seven. So she got this uh, very nice result. And um, I already built in, in my mind the whole theory of uh, how the KV problem admits a unique solution, right? Because uh, we said this KV group acts freely and transitively on the space of solutions. Of course, if it goes uh, zero up to degree seven, I mean, and that depends how optimistic you are. I was very optimistic. I was thinking, okay, like it's always zero, it's clear. But then uh, my collaborator, uh, Charles Torosian, uh, he said, no, 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 seven, it's a very, very small number. Like it's not serious. And then he set up with one of his uh, former classmates. They, they made a computer program which, which could comp make experiments for uh, higher degrees. And uh, in fact, uh, the KV1, I think there is a package called Lee, which was uh, easy to implement to solve KV1, but KV2 is a strange thing about those cyclic words. They had to write, a, to do the programming themselves. And I think the most difficult was feeding the results of one of the programs to the other. I think that was the most difficult technical problem they solved. And, you know, they started like, finding non-zero numbers. And first I, I was saying, yeah, look, but your problems are so complicated that, I mean, surely you make mistakes. But then, uh, you know, those things, they, they were coming up and coming up. And then in, in the end, I got convinced and, and then we found, uh, uh, we found the map from uh, GRT to KV and about GRT1, it was known that it's huge. So for instance, this, this guy in degree eight is a Lie bracket of sigma three and sigma five of the first two um, Dreamfield, uh, Ihara Dreamfield generators. Right, so, um, so this, uh, as far as I, uh, at least the last time I heard about it, I think, um, so we can compare everything uh, with, uh, with this Lie algebra, right? We, we, we conjecture that all of them are the same. And I think um, here uh, for DS, 
I believe it is probably checked up to degree 19 and for KV probably till degree 16 that uh, that it holds but then again right the question is 16 and 19 are they big numbers or maybe uh, next time at some degree 137 you would have a deviation who, who knows so uh let me conclude by revisiting um revisiting this page so um i've shown you many things, but I, I should apologize. I uh, haven't shown two very interesting pieces. One of them uh, is the link to 4D topology. It was developed by Dencho and Barnathan, and now there are other people working on it. So here it's a little bit intentional because I don't master it very well. That's why I even didn't try too much to, to bring it in. Now, this BV story is uh, very beautiful. The BV story is telling you how, uh, uh, what is the geometric structure uh, on moduli spaces of flat connections, which corresponds to um, Turaev co bracket. So, the classical theory of Goldman tells you that uh, the tier board symplectic Poisson structure corresponds to the Goldman bracket. Uh, but to derive co bracket, we should associate the uh, BV structure. And to have a BV structure, we have to go to super groups. So these are moduli spaces for super groups, uh, which carry those BV structures, uh, which are naturally associated to uh, derive co bracket. But I think uh, we should stop here. And uh, well, this, this we should leave to whatever another talk, another mini course. Uh, like uh, maybe the next edition of this school. So um, I would like to thank the organizers again for organizing the school and for giving me an opportunity to speak. And uh, I'm very grateful for the audience for staying with me. And uh, I think I stop here. Thank you. So thank you very much, Anton, again. So questions? Uh, there was something in the chart. Uh, did you check? Uh, yeah, no. Uh, it's mm -hmm. meaning of Pentagon equation. What is the meaning of Pentagon equation, the Goldman to Rife story? Mm -hmm. um, right. Um, good, good question. Uh, maybe, let's say, uh, um, um, you see, uh, I think, uh, let, let me answer first in a somewhat cryptic way. I think if I knew the answer to that story, possibly I would be able to show that the Goldman to Rife implies Pentagon, right? Because uh, what does it mean to show there is Pentagon there? At the moment, what happens, right? Given a solution of the uh, Pentagon equation, I can construct uh, a solution of the KV problem using those formulas. And from solution of the KV problem, I can induce, this is one-to-one, -one, I can induce uh, a map, which is um, uh, a morphism or isomorphism of uh, Goldman to Rife Lie by algebra to its associated rate. But at the moment, I don't know whether all such maps come from associators, which is quite plausible, but it's not known. So, uh, so let's say if uh, the conjecture about if everything is isomorphic to everything, then the answer to your question is uh, you consider a map uh, which uh, gives you an isomorphism of Goldman derived to its associated graded. From that map, you reconstruct an element phi, and that element phi will satisfy Pentagon. So that that's a dream theorem. Um, but we actually don't know whether it's true. Okay, more questions? So if there are no more questions, let me uh, thank Anton again on behalf of all the people who are listening. Um, I actually have a small question yeah. to the organizers. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, you never asked, but in principle, I can send you my file. Oh. Uh, of course, I don't know whether you find it useful. 
uh, so we, we have recordings at the moment, but if uh, if we could also have the notes by themselves, I think. Yeah, this this file that uh, that that we, we have now in front of us. Yeah, I think it would be great if we could collect the files and also post them. On I'll the be internet. I'll be happy to send you uh, the file, and I'll be happy if you post it together with the link. Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. So thanks a lot, Anton. That okay. Be... Thanks. Thank you again, and uh, well, uh, uh, good continuation of the school. Yes.